Meet Violet. Every day, you can find her putting miles on her toy trucks. It doesn't matter if it's a teddy bear, a doll, or a stack of building blocks. Deliveries need to be made. And Violet is the only one who knows how to get them from point A to point B. At SAE International, giving students like Violet the chance to experience, collaborate, and think about ways to move society into the future is what motivates all we do. Because we know that in a few years, she'll be showing her little sister how she built the winning jet toy car for Mr. Murphy's sixth grade science class. And a few years after that, she'll be working with her college classmates to build their very own self-driving car, which in turn will lead to a job as a junior and then lead engineer for an autonomous trucking company. The SAE STEM programs, which start in pre-K and go all the way through college, will put Violet on a path of discovery, innovation, and inspiration. While it might just be playtime for now, we know that someday Violet's going to walk confidently into her office. Deliveries will need to be made, and she'll be the one making it happen. Good luck, Violet. And welcome everyone to the AutoStar Middleware and Software Defined Vehicle Virtual Technical Meeting. Thanks for joining us today and thanks to SAE Detroit section for hosting the event. My name is Eric Sessa. I'll be your moderator for today. Just a little background on me. I'm Vice President and General Manager of at ETOS Americas. For those of you who don't know ETOS, we're a full service solution provider for the Software Defined Vehicle. Our portfolio includes <clears throat> the required in-vehicle software stacks, holistic cybersecurity solutions, as well as cloud-based backend operations. Today, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Nigel Tracy. Nigel's our Vice President of RTA Solutions at ETOS. Among his many responsibilities is coordinating our AutoSAR participation, as well as the strategy for this across ETOS. Before we start, just a few housekeeping items. Everybody's going to be automatically muted and their cameras will be turned off. So please, as we're presenting today, use the chat function. We've got plenty of time at the end scheduled for Q&A. And uh, I think Nigel and I are definitely looking forward to that part of the, that part of the event today. The, the event is also, or the presentation is also being recorded and will be posted on SA Detroit section YouTube channel at a later date. And I think with that, um, let's get started. I'll hand it over to Nigel for the first part of, of today's uh, festivities. Great, thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks a lot and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you. So as Eric just said, um, what we're gonna talk about today is um, what is very much a hot topic in the automotive industry uh, at the moment, which is the path towards um, uh, the software defined vehicle. And we'll talk about how we need to reinvent how automotive software development is done here. And I think this is important that it's uh, it's a race, but it's not against each other or against the rest of the industry. It's rather just something where we have to work together to make this massive transformation uh, for the automotive industry. So let's dig in and get started with some uh, um, foundation as to what, what's driving this transfer, transformation in the mobility world. Why do we need to uh, uh, transform uh, and adopt to stay ahead and stay competitive? Well, I think, First and foremost, uh, the software complexity in the car is really uh, uh, hitting this inflection point that you can see uh, from this graph here. It's already um, uh, the case today that uh, a typical car is already one of the most complex software systems that mankind's built with hundreds of millions of lines of code distributed across the vehicle. And we're seeing um, with this move towards electrification, uh, autonomous driving, connectivity, that this is taking the next step change um, in, in complexity and growing uh, significantly. Um, that means we need new ways of coping uh, and handling this level of software complexity. But it's not only the software complexity, the architectures themselves uh, are changing. So for a long while, uh, basically since the uh, mid to late 1990s, cars have been built up of a networked collection of ECUs 
that all perform a certain set of functions that are somewhat separated from each other, and they coordinate and um, uh, work with each other through network communication. But up until recently, they're not deeply integrated. As um, systems have become more complex, this distributed network of ECUs has got more and more complex for the uh, vehicle OEMs to integrate and make work together. And that integration testing is only getting more and more complex. So if you look at a typical modern car, there might be four, five, even up to uh, 10 or 12 ECUs that are all trying to decide should the car be going faster or slower right now. And uh, that's a huge integration challenge to get all of those separately developed ECUs, probably built by different suppliers, to come to the same conclusion in all situations. And what we're seeing is a big push towards managing this complexity through centralization of the architecture, uh, an introduction, uh, introduction of a more powerful centralized compute layer that's making decisions on the vehicle layer, so a kind of decision layer on top of the control layer that already exists in the car. Um, to make those vehicle level decisions and then uh, command uh, the embedded systems uh, to perform the necessary actuation for that. Um, but these more centralized uh, architectures uh, are also driving up the software complexity because, of course, they're now running more powerful uh, microprocessors that are running more complex software to make these uh, uh, complex decisions um, and coordinate them uh, on the vehicle level. What we're also seeing, the third big trend, is this um, very important decoupling uh, of the software and hardware development process. So for years, and, and uh, basically um, since software was introduced in the car, um, the car came with the software, and that was also how it finished its life, pretty much with the same software in there. So on the day you took delivery of your vehicle, that was the best it was ever going to be, um, because basically nothing got updated over the life. It just got progressively older. Um, the expectation now and the desire now is that uh, on the day you take delivery of the car, that should be the worst it's ever going to be, because over its lifetime, um, the software is continuously uh, updated. And that means moving to a model that is much more like what we're used to and familiar to from the IT domain with our computers or from the mobile phone industry, um, um, where the operating systems and software is continuously updated. And then the hardware goes through iterations and generations that is decoupled from that software. And you can deploy the software perhaps on multiple uh, generations of the hardware with different capabilities. Um, that is also driving a significant um, uh, need to more quickly and continuously develop and deploy the software uh, across this evolving range of hardware uh, over the lifetime, which is very different from uh, today's and yesterday's tight coupling uh, of these two um, parts of the development process. So all of that together is what's driving us towards the situation that software is basically going to uh, eat the mobility world as it has done in the mobile um, uh, world and in the uh, um, computer uh, and, and uh, IT world. Um, so this is uh, uh, really in uh, um, essence what the software defined vehicle is all about. What's important though is that the software is not the same as all of the software in the car. Um, there is a significantly um, uh, different uh, scope of, of software that we see in cars today. So you have one cluster uh, of software in the car, which is about deeply embedded ECUs, um, typically written in C, running in a microcontroller with a real-time operating system, managing the physics and the control uh, of the vehicle, whatever that be from uh, managing the window wipers to running uh, the battery management system. Um, but that's a very different kind of software from what we're now seeing introduced on vehicle computers, which are trying to add this decision-making layer uh, to the car. Here, you typically see that these are running on more powerful microprocessors um, because the algorithms are much bigger and more complicated and require that extra computational power uh, of, a, of a big, powerful uh, microprocessor. Are typically running on uh, uh, POSIX operating systems and written in C++ um, and are much further away from the details of the deeply embedded uh, uh, hardware. 
You're then also seeing through connectivity, uh, the connector uh, to the back end and, and cloud infrastructure um, in order to uh, uh, run services that require uh, data and information that can only be stored off board. And these are written in a completely different way using a DevOps um, and, and service oriented uh, architecture uh, and service oriented business model, um, really living in the IT domain, uh, using different languages from the IT domain, from scripting languages, um, to web hosted uh, um, development languages. And then finally, you've got the infotainment systems uh, and the rest of the connectivity. Um, and here you're again talking about a different environment. Uh, so you're talking about connectivity with wireless LAN and various um, generations of mobile connectivity. Um, but you're also looking at completely different um, uh, development environments and software platform infrastructures, things like Android, iOS, um, mobile apps um, and dedicated SDKs and development environments uh, for these kind of uh, um, software environments. So you can see there's no kind of um, uniform uh, software in the car. Um, uh, there's a lot of different domains that all need to be taken care of. But if you want to deploy a feature into the car, you possibly need to update software in all of these different environments in order to provide the end-to-end -end, uh, feature um, being added to the car. And that means we need to figure out how to extend and integrate uh, these different platforms um, uh, to implement a modern software feature. So how do we connect the deeply embedded ECUs to the vehicle decisions being taken within the vehicle computer? Um, how do we uh, connect and which parts of the system do we run uh, in the back end? And how do we integrate and systematically deploy all of that into the vehicle in a safe, secure uh, way? with the necessary quality requirements that are required uh, by the automotive industry where typical products are produced in millions of units and therefore uh, quality and reliability uh, is absolutely critical. So this gives us really a challenge to, uh, to figure out how to ensure uh, a holistic uh, software um, uh, is deployed into the vehicle and how we have competency across all of these different domains. And maybe just to give an example uh, of the kind of feature that might need all of these elements to be deployed uh, in the vehicle, let, let's make up an example here of a distributed function um, with the idea of a friction map. So a friction map could be used by a car's uh, cruise control system to adapt the speed that the car's driving based on um, the friction coefficient uh, uh, on the road uh, at the time. And to implement this, this would require the vehicle's embedded system, its ESP, to identify where are icy patches on the road. Then this uh, data with the exact location of the slippery parts of the road uh, would be communicated to the cloud. Um, via the cloud, other cars could access this data and get the information on where the, uh, uh, or how the friction was in different parts uh, of the road. And then either a warning message can then be displayed in these vehicles or the adaptive cruise control uh, can be modified to cause the vehicle to drive slower where the uh, um, friction um, is, is indicating that the road is icy. Um, and this can obviously help to, uh, uh, this reduced speed can help to avoid instances, but for uh, avoid accidents. But for this to work, of course, the function needs to be distributed. There's an embedded component that must run in the braking system of the car. There's a part that must run in the cloud and manage this data on top of the map layer uh, of how the friction is at all the various points on the road. Um, then um, the distribution to the other cars obviously requires the connectivity module to uh, in all of the other vehicles to obtain this data from the cloud. And then Displaying the information uh, as a warning to the driver requires coordination with the cockpit systems or the, um, the infotainment systems to uh, update the driver of the current driving conditions of the part of the road they're on. And finally, if you want to connect it also to automatic speed reduction uh, in an adaptive cruise control, again, you're then integrated back with the embedded system. So you see to deploy even something as simple as this friction map, you've got to touch all of these different parts of the software uh, uh, stack in the system. And if we look just to uh, um, see that one level deeper uh, and to go uh, a, a little bit more into the details then how these software systems are um, required to be built, what we see uh, from our perspective is five 
very different verticals um, that have not only different um, software characteristics, but completely different process methods and tools for creating that software. So not only is the software different, but the processes, um, the methods in which you need to work and the tool chain in which you need to uh, create the software um, is also different. So the first pillar that we've got is the kind of classical deeply embedded world, which is well known in the automotive industry for the last now nearly 30 years of the safe hard real time. Today, that's typically running uh, an Autosar uh, operating system and has an embedded uh, development tool chain to build and configure those Autosar systems and deploy into uh, deeply embedded microcontroller systems. Then in the safety and autonomous driving dom um, domain, you're starting to see because of the computational needs, the introduction of a microprocessor, and also because autonomous driving is um, really a complicated data handling system, um, then you're also seeing a tool chain that focuses much more on the management uh, of the data uh, and using the data effectively and efficiently in the development process. Um, also, with the move to the microprocessor, these will typically be running in environments like on uh, an Autosar adaptive stack, running a POSIX operating system, something like Linux or QNX uh, here. Then you've got the non-ASIL domain, the quality managed, the QM functions. Uh, and this is where you can deploy new capabilities, new vehicle apps, uh, and uh, update the software um, um, with new um, functionality um, uh, on the fly, like we do on our mobile phones by deploying um, uh, applications. And this will run a completely different kind of middleware and operating system. Um, and we'll have typically a completely different kind of uh, development tool chain, much more focused on uh, edge nodes like IoT device development. Um, and uh, therefore, this edge development tool chain also looks very different from the previous two. Next up, we have the uh, infotainment domain. Um, and in the infotainment domain, of course, we're talking about something that's uh, fairly graphics heavy um, and therefore... Uh, what we're seeing more and more is, of course, Linux-based systems are very heavily used here. And, of, uh, of course, also Android uh, automotive-based systems, uh, along with other proprietary systems in this uh, vehicle infotainment uh, environment. But again, a very different development tool chain for building the user experience that's expected uh, to um, uh, convey uh, the brand and the functionality that the OEM wants to do here. So again, now we have a fourth uh, uh, development environment. And then finally, we've got the application agnostic services and the cloud development tool chain to build the backend services. And again, here, that's a completely uh, different uh, environment. So these are five entirely different domains that actually require us to have different approaches um, to building the software and to manage uh, that, that development process of the software. So uh, different process methods and tools. And yet to deploy one simple function, as we saw on the last slide, you need to somehow coordinate that across all of these different development processes. And that's really where the complexity comes in, um, especially if we look um, at, at how things are today. So if we uh, look uh, today, starting on the right-hand side here, what is typical in the development and deployment of backend services um, running on server infrastructure, um, from uh, any of the well-known uh, cloud service providers, then typically here you see DevOps cycles that are running extremely fast with deployments many times a day, uh, typically. Uh, so you're developing and deploying software on a pretty much continuous basis. Um, then on the vehicle level with these vehicle controllers, you're somewhere, uh, somehow uh, somewhere in the middle um, integrating and collecting the data from the backend cycle, but you can't deploy uh, today this software quite so frequently in the vehicle because it has safety uh, requirements. And then on the very left-hand side where uh, a large majority of the systems are today, I mean, pretty much you don't really have an operation cycle. You just have this development cycle, but it takes typically months to develop, to qualify, and to release into the field a new version of the software. And that's even if you can uh, deploy it uh, uh, in the field. And that gives us one of the challenges is if we want to deploy a new function uh, and capability, it's really a challenge if it takes us months to put it in the embedded system, like the friction map with the extension that would be needed in the ESP system, 
Whereas in the backend system, we could implement that new feature in just a few days, but we've got to put this all in sync uh, in order to uh, be able to move towards the software defined vehicle and deploy these functions in a consistent and stable and regular uh, uh, way. And that's where we need to move to uh, a setup where we try to get these DevOps cycles much more in sync, which means uh, finding ways to speed up the DevOps cycle uh, in the vehicle, especially. And that can be done through um, technologies such as ECU virtualization. So you can do a lot more of the development in a virtual environment and validate these deeply embedded systems more quickly um, through containerization so that when you change part of the system in a deeply embedded system, you've not got to go through all of the testing and qualification again of the complete software uh, set up in the car. Um, and of course, uh, abstracting away from the hardware details and using software layers uh, to allow this development to be more efficient um, in, in the deeply embedded system. And that will help us bring um, the DevOps cycles for both the um, deeply embedded and also this vehicle level a little bit more in sync with the backend services. I, I don't think because here we're talking about systems that still are safety relevant. Um, I don't think we get to deploying things many times a day. That's probably not a good idea for something on which drivers' lives depend. But you can certainly speed things up so it's not taking you six, nine months to deploy a simple software update to the deeply embedded systems. But all of these things are challenges um, to improve the development process um, and the underlying software abstraction so that you can speed up um, this uh, uh, development process itself. changing okay and that requires us to move away in a very disruptive way to what we're used to in the automotive industry and that will require cultural technology uh, changes along with value chain changes and organizational changes i mean what we're very used to in the automotive industry is a traditional uh, v model based development where we work our way through requirements through design implementation and testing and then we release and at the end of this process, typically the project team is finished and they stop work and move on to their next project. Um, obviously, this doesn't give you any ability to have continuous update of the software, continuous integration um, of new capabilities and new functionality. And that's where we need to get to by really introducing um, a DevOps cycle so that we can make progress in small slices uh, to get a handle on the complexity, the cost, the quality um, by small incremental development steps, delivering uh, fully functional software with new capabilities bit by bit, rather than the traditional V model uh, that does everything um, uh, together. It also means organizationally we have to change because if we want to continuously update software, we can't have project teams that just start and finish. Um, they have to be teams that continue to work on the software over a much longer period much like we're familiar with uh, in the development of software uh, in the IT domain uh, or the um, uh, mobile domain, where a team is working from version one, version two, version three, version four. They don't just uh, finish a project, ship it, and then move on to a completely different project. And last but not least, we also need to exploit and use data and AI-driven development a lot more to help us uh, gain speed, efficiency, and flexibility to achieve these shorter uh, uh, innovation cycles. So these are the challenges uh, that we face uh, in making the transformation to the software-defined vehicle. Um, let me hand over now to Eric, who will pick up now and talk a little bit about what ETAS has done um, to make uh, the step forwards here, and then also uh, how we think together the industry can move forwards and solve some of these problems. So Eric, back to you. Thanks, Nigel. So maybe I give you a thumbs up and you can you can forward the slides since you have control. Yep. Sound good? Okay. Yeah, so so what what have we done at ETAS to, to deal with these complexities that Nigel was talking about? So in January of 22, ETAS and our parent company, Bosch, we initiated a project to sort of redefine our approach, strengthen the capabilities of ETAS. Obviously, we recognize that the evolving market dynamics and the need for us to adapt. And, and how did we do this? 
So first we took Bosch's auto side development expertise, which was contained in its cross domain computing solutions division. We combined that with the knowledge and experience Bosch had in back end and SDV development in a project they did, which originated from its former connected services division. And then we combined that with what existed within e within ETOS's competencies and portfolios and launched the new ETOS in January of 23 under the shared model of empowering tomorrow's automotive software. Our vision for the new ETOS is to empower automotive companies in their transformation towards the software-defined vehicles, supporting them mastering this complexity that Nigel talked about, improving development speed, another thing Nigel mentioned, as well as navigating all the challenges and opportunities that pre pre present themselves in the industry today. Maybe the next slide, Nigel. So from our perspective, what capabilities are crucial to understand in order to manage this transition? Um, I think we've identified three, there's probably more, but these three we think are very important and Nigel talked first about speed. So we need to dramatically decrease our development times. It's going to be essential to keep up with the rapidly evolving industry to deliver cutting edge solutions at the speed that our customers are asking for. Secondly, we need the ability to deploy and manage software at scale with updates for millions of indiv individualized vehicles. I mean, you think about what, where we're moving towards. Everybody, every vehicle is not going to be the same going down the road. It's certainly not from a software perspective. And this is gonna require efficient and scalable infrastructure to support these operations. And then thirdly, and, and maybe this is obvious to everybody, but we believe that a data-driven approach to development is gonna be crucial. And then I think this also, maybe this also goes without saying, but all of these capabilities, we've gotta achieve them still considering the constraints of the autom automotive industry, the requirements and boundary conditions we have, say around safety or security moving forward. Next slide. But you might ask, why do we need to change? What's wrong with the current approach? Um, I think, you know, again, there's there's three things that we would point out here. Uh, with proprietary solutions or everybody's everybody creating their own solution, there's very little exchange within the industry or within our companies. Um, there's no open standards. We're continually reinventing the wheel over and over again, which ultimately slows the entire creativity for the industry, which in turn is going to drive up costs and our time to market for, or the time to market for all of us. And certainly last but not least, and maybe from my point of view, the most important, there just aren't enough developers. I mean, we're all in a war for talent right now, and maybe this is good for the developers on the call, but I assume we also have some managers who are on the call here with us that are struggling to recruit the talent they need. And, and just in the end, we, we all aren't gonna be able to hire 10,000 software developers. It's just not a feasible solution to the problem. So next slide, Nigel. So we think, you know, as we wrestle with this make, maybe go to the next slide here. We go through these next three a little bit quick. The make versus buy, we think there's a third option, which for us would be to integrate and collaborate. Next slide. And how, how, do, how do we integrate and collaborate? So to us, this moves us or leads us to the open source, the, to, to open source. And, and maybe to best understand what open source is for us, we, maybe we use a parallel example within the industry that I think everybody's probably aware of, and that's AutoCert. So in the past, everyone developed their basic software stacks and diagnostics for each ECU separately. And, you know, making the integration of all these different ECUs within the vehicle architecture a bit challenging. With AutoSAR, though, and the standardization that came from AutoSAR, this problem was primarily solved for, microcontroller, for the microcontroller world. And everyone, now we can create solutions based on an agreed upon open industry standard. But... And with open source software, this works similarly, right? We've got, um, but this, we've got the same sort of um, thing happening, but at a, at a higher level of abstraction. 
instead of sharing only specifications, we're sharing the actual code. And this approach will be much faster because we don't need to align the entire community or consortium around specifications. The code itself becomes a standard and it's developed according to what the community thinks is the best, best way to implement. Don't, don't get me wrong or don't get, um, don't get me wrong here. The, from, from our perspective, my perspective, we're not talking either or. I believe and we believe at ETAS that Autosar and, and um, open source software can, will, must coexist. But we believe that open source software is one of the things that will enable the industry to take that step forward and, and do the kind of the things that Nigel was talking about of aligning the development cycles and, and getting them more aligned to what the industry or what the customers are gonna be expecting moving forward. Next slide, Nigel. So obviously we talked about open source. I've just talked about open source software. What has ETAS done to support the open source community and overcome some of the challenges that exist, will exist, moving forward and, and what do we really mean by integrate and collaborate as an industry? So to ETAS, this means on one hand, using the available building blocks for the groundwork to free up resources, create differentiating products and services on top of those. And while still creating and enhancing these building blocks for the software defined vehicle in an industry shared effort. Therefore, Together with Microsoft in October of, 19, of 2021, we did this. We founded a working group for this exact purpose. Um, and last year in March, we started it with, uh, with a total of 12 members under the Eclipse Foundation umbrella. We created the Software Defined Vehicles Working Group. I think we've, we've started it with a great shared vision. We're looking to create an open technology platform that's automotive grade, it's got open standards and is, and is community driven. Next slide, Nigel. So fast forward from March and, um, of last year to today, we've moved from 12 to 33 members strong, very good, um, highly reputable companies on the, on the list in front of you guys. Um, we're super excited by the growth of this, um, something that we at ETAS are proud of being a part of and really looking forward to the future of open source software within the automotive community. Next slide, Nigel. So to sum up, um, to take a look at the future, I think it's important to understand the levels of cooperation needed to achieve our goals. So currently our focus here is, is, is on level zero. Um, we're looking at driving aligned projects in the open source community just to get the ball rolling here. In parallel, we're also working on level one, which involves the integration of existing artifacts and components into corresponding domains like Autosar, container runtimes, backend services to create managed platform components. Level two is where we'll be able to develop and integrate cross system services to solve the challenges of a distributed system. And then finally, with level three, we can achieve product program specific integration, validation, and then final deployment to the vehicle. And we believe these levels of cooperation are essential for us to meet the challenges that, that Nigel talked about in the, in, in, uh, in the beginning part of the presentation here, um, and, and to move the, our industry forward to support the needs, the needs of our customers and our customers' customers. And I think with that, we can close the presentation part and then move on to probably the, hopefully the best part, which would be the questions. Um, and while I get into the chat to look, maybe Nigel, um, just a little primary question here. Uh, I talked about um, Autosar and open source software coexisting, maybe elaborate on how you think that can really happen in, in, the, in the industry. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I think we already see that starting to happen and we see a shift. So I, I think you mentioned, Eric, that uh, obviously when Autosar was started, what is it now, 15, 16 years ago, um, it was all about collaboration on a standard in terms of specifications. 
And then vendors like ETAS and others took those specifications and created products um, that, that implement uh, against those specifications um, um, then uh, products. Um, what you see in open source is basically a very similar approach, only instead of creating specifications that are then independently implemented, you collaborate instead directly on the code uh, and the software itself. And we see already even Autosar has started to uh, started to move in this direction when it introduced the new adaptive platform a few years ago. There's a reference implementation. So while the collaboration still is on implementing uh, specifications and, and documenting um, the specifications and APIs of the Autosar adaptive platform, in parallel, there's then a reference implementation uh, or a uh, a uh, demonstrator that shows not only can those requirements be implemented, but they can be implemented efficiently and effectively. And open source is just taking that to the next level uh, um, um, to then say, let's focus only uh, on, on the shared code uh, base as our common understanding, and let's share the effort on, uh, on that development process. And we've seen this be successful in other fields. I mean, Linux is, of course, uh, wildly successful as an operating system and runs exactly uh, uh, in that mode and, and has done since it started. Uh, and we see that more and more um, uh, happening for these um, uh, new areas of the automotive industry. And it's not only the initiative you mentioned, Eric, uh, with our work with the Eclipse SDV working group, uh, together with this uh, large number of partners that have now joined, but there's other um, uh, open source and collaboration initiatives um, like the Conversa um, standard or uh, an, an implementation around a set of vehicle um, uh, APIs or, or vehicle signaling interfaces, um, the activities that ARM uh, uh, pushed around SOFI, around uh, uh, the boot up and software defined vehicle uh, processes a little bit closer to the hardware there. And these things are all coming uh, together. So I think we will see uh, basically an ecosystem of things that need to be brought together. Uh, some of them might stay in the legacy uh, approach of uh, collaborate on standards and compete on the implementation, and others might follow the pure open source approach, which is to collaborate on the implementation itself. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So one of the big things that I think... Um, so traditional automotive people are very... Um, concerned about their intellectual property, right? And so one of the big questions always with open source is, well, how do I put my intellectual property up for everybody to take and give away what, all of my, all of my um, knowledge to, to the, for the greater good, so to speak. So how do you, how maybe in the past or the other industries like Linux, how have they dealt with intellectual property? How do you see this moving? How do you see this moving in the auto industry? Um, so, so first, I think it, it comes from the realization that most of what we're talking about here is enabling technology, and it's not what differentiates. I mean, we should be clear, no one shows up to the car showroom to say, uh, I want to buy this vehicle because it has an awesome can stack inside the car, um, simply doesn't figure as a differentiating thing for the buyer of a vehicle. Um, therefore, getting too worried about the IP ownership around topics like that is, is not what's really going to uh, um, win the game uh, in the long run. Um, and, and as you presented, Eric, um, uh, towards the end there, I think there's not enough development resource uh, available to the automotive industry um, right. to... Um, not move towards this sharing and, and working together on the stuff that's not importantly differentiating um, because we we can't afford to have developers all building the same as each other. Um, and that's exactly what uh, um, we saw as other industries transformed into software-driven industries. I mean, at the very beginning of the computer um, era, in the uh, or, or the home computer era in the 1970s and 1980s, every computer manufacturer had to implement their own operating system and create their own applications. Uh, and they all did it from scratch uh, each time. And then over the years, that transitioned into basically an ecosystem where there's three primary desktop OSs, Windows, um, Mac OS, and, uh, and Linux. We saw the same kind of transformation in the mobile phone industry. I mean, in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, 
every mobile handset manufacturer created the base software and the capabilities of the cell phone um, uh, themselves or all in-house. But again, as the industry transitioned to be driven by software and the value moving to software, then we saw that industry also move towards um, collaboration uh, and basically two mobile phone operating systems like we see today. So collaboration yeah. in Android uh, and a uh, uh, iOS approach uh, with, with a vertical uh, solution, um, simply because it's not possible for everyone to build that stuff um, uh, themselves. So um, step by step, it's a transition we've got to go through in the industry to realize owning the IP and the stuff that customers value is probably what's important. And uh, not getting too worried about the IP ownership of the stuff that cust your customers don't care about might be smart. I mean, you might even argue, like, if you take Autosar, for example, I mean, what we obviously we supply the industry with 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 the Autosar stack, right? What's the what's our IP in that stack? I mean, it's an open standard, right? Like, I mean, are we really sharing any of our own IP in that standard? I would. No, I would argue not. Right? No, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And certainly anything there is not really truly differentiating in terms of what the right. uh, end vehicle manufacturer cares about. I mean, of course, it can be in a some way differentiating in terms of it can make your development process a little bit more efficient. It can help you get your car ready for production a little bit faster. But no end user cares what Autosar stacks inside the car. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um. I'm looking at the questions here. Um, so Sidharth has a question. If, if the car will utilize one middleware layer or vendor across the different MCUs, how will adoption work on the supplier tier one end? Um, so, I, so I don't know that it will adopt one middleware um, across the whole vehicle, across all of the different microcontrollers uh, in the car. Um, but obviously there still needs to be a way in which you can deploy software across those different middleware. So I showed, um, I, I think in that slide that was very busy and, and complicated, at least five different development methodologies and their associated middleware for the five different domains that we see um, uh, in the vehicle uh, space. And I think uh, there, the important thing is that you can deploy a function and coordinate it across those different domains. Uh, as I showed with the friction map example, you need to deploy little bits of software in the deeply embedded system, little bits of functionality to coalesce the data in the cloud, and then little bits of functionality in the IVI system to warn the driver, or again, in the embedded system to uh, tune and adapt the uh, adaptive cruise control system. But it doesn't mean they all have to run the same middleware, it simply means you have to have the ability to develop and deploy those software into those different domains. Now, there is one interesting question, which is, can the APIs and the way you do that development be different for every OEM? And can every OEM have their own proprietary vehicle API and the way of deploying that software? And that's possible, but it raises one interesting question, which is, would the scale of deployment be big enough in order to attract enough application developers to create apps that have enough value. And, and that's one thing that I guess is not settled yet in software defined vehicle. Um, um, and the OEMs uh, all, all obviously being more interested in uh, uh, trying to have an ecosystem for, for themselves. Um, but what you saw in the mobile phone space, I mean, in, in the Early 2000s, mid 2000s, um, you had um, uh, Palm based mobile phones, you had uh, BlackBerry mobile phones, and they all had app infrastructure, app development environments, and, and you could buy apps. But you know what? No one did because they were too expensive. And they were expensive because developing them was relatively expensive. But you could, uh, the number of customers was relatively small. And yeah. consequently, you had this cycle where there weren't enough customers, but the um, due to the development cost, you had to charge a high price. And because the price was high, you had no customers, um, creating this vicious circle. 
what really changed in 2007 when uh, Apple launched the iPhone or a year later when they introduced the App Store is it very quickly drove down prices for the app ecosystem very, very low because of the huge scale in which they could be deployed. Therefore, you could still make money by selling apps cheaply and it got into this um, virtuous cycle. And I think that's still one challenge ahead of us, uh, how, how to get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so another another question. Um, so you talked about we're at an inflection point with the no, with the amount of software going into vehicles, right? Um, yeah. So with are there any risks from in your opinion? Are there any risks associated with rapidly increasing the amount of software in vehicles? Yeah, I mean, there's there's two main drivers for that um, that that are causing this huge uh, jump, or or maybe a third one is also involved as well. So first, the one big driver is the introduction of higher levels of driver assistance and even autonomous driving systems, and they are complex systems with a large amount of code, um, and that's causing a big part of this step change. The second big thing is the introduction of um, uh, digital cockpits and integrated IVI systems basically turning the car into a mobile phone on wheels. And that's a very large amount of software um, yep. that uh, uh, goes into the vehicle in terms of lines of code, also accelerating uh, that. But we kind of know how to manage that complexity because that's what we've been doing in the PC area for, for a very long while. Um, so there are some challenges. It definitely means, um, uh, as we talked about, we have to get faster at writing software because... What I showed is the amount of software is forecast to grow by a factor of 10 by 2025 compared to 2020. But you know what? Most likely the automotive industry won't have 10 times the software developers in it by 2025 than it did in 2020. <laughs> and therefore, everybody's got to get more productive somewhere, somehow. Uh, otherwise, we simply won't be able to create that volume of software that's forecast and needed for the capabilities that drivers are proven to be willing to pay for. Um, so there are some risks, but I think the biggest one is how do we get more productive fast enough to be able to realize that with the talent that we have for software development? Because um, I think you you said it towards the end, Eric, that's not going up by a factor of 10. So therefore, people right, have got to write exactly. three, four times more software than they were five years ago every day. Um, and that doesn't happen by just working harder. It has to be working smarter. Smarter. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I would also say... Maybe part of the, some saving grace here is like all of the software we're looking to add, or like, like you said, a lot of the software that's contributing to the inflection point. We're not talking about safety critical pieces of software, right? So you can you your rigor there is a little bit different than like you said in the beginning about you know we've got to be careful with with certain parts, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously the ADAS system is definitely right. right smack in the middle of that safety critical and, and very yeah. important. But the the volume of software going in the IVI system, the thing to play movies in the uh, backseat of the cars or in the passenger yeah. side of the car, you know, that's as critical as the software is on your mobile phone, which means uh, people get irritated when it doesn't work, but nobody dies. <laughs> yes, exactly. You um, hear a lot of noise from the kids in the back when it breaks, but uh, yeah, right. uh, apart from that, all is good. <laughs> so, I, okay, this is another good open source question. So, who takes that uh, Bob pose? So, who takes responsibility? Who's who owns the liability? So, you know, obviously, somebody's pulling down a, a, an open source stack and they're implementing it. In their within their vehicle architecture in in, the, in a given ECU, who owns the who owns the uh, who owns the liability? Yeah, so maybe if I go back to that slide that you showed um, uh, here, here Eric, I think this this tries to show it that actually what you talk about is collaboration on the code and creating this open source, but there will still be a need for the individual integration of support and uh, maintenance, the liability, and also the product compliance uh, of the overall offering. And that, of course, is a business opportunity. And you've seen companies in the IT space, for example, doing this like Red Hat with their long-term maintenance branches of Linux. Um, and they take responsibility on behalf of um, companies who are interested in buying their products. 
um, for taking care of the support and long-term maintenance, uh, for standing behind the open source code with uh, uh, liability coverage and for ensuring its compliance to requirements, standards, safety uh, uh, and security uh, topics. And I think we will see exactly the same in the automotive industry. So that's one of the areas where we uh, um, expect to play a role as ETAS, as a software supplier to enable um, the automotive industry with their SDV software, is to do exactly this, not only to build the open source software, but then to make it viable to put it into deployments by supporting customers with um, the necessary levels of long-term support and maintenance. Because as we mentioned, you've got to take account of the fact that the automotive industry is not the mobile phone industry or the PC industry. Product life cycles are long. Um, I mean, you've got to take care of this software probably for a period of around about 20 years. Um, you can't just say it's three years old, I, I've forgotten about it. And of course, you've got to take care of the safety and security of it as well. Um, so there's these uh, blue, green and light blue layers on the right hand side here, uh, I, I think are uh, opportunities uh, for companies and, and ETAS will be um, uh, engaged in those activities. Yeah, t t this is a place where you add value, right? Exactly. Um, so you mentioned maintenance. Um, there, we've got a question in here about how, how does the software defined vehicle affect the repair process or the dealership service department? So one key foundation of the it software defined vehicle. It might be a little bit out of our purview, but. <laughs> yeah, but one, one key thing of the software defined vehicle that, that obviously we didn't uh, specifically mention, but it's it's a key enabling technology is the ability to update the software in the field efficiently and regularly. Um, that obviously opens up a, um, a repairability topic um, uh, that is starting to get more common in cars today with over-the-air software updates to fix problems without having to call the car back into the dealer. But it's not, not so prevalent everywhere, but that's a key enabling technology for software-defined vehicle. And of course, once you've put the infrastructure in place to update the software for a vehicle over the air, you've then got a connection to the car that can be used for all kinds of things related to repairability. So um, you can have uh, access to the diagnostics data um, such that when a car is coming in for a service, you know what needs doing to it and you have the spare parts ready, um, giving a better customer experience all the way through to proactive prognostics where you're predicting yeah. what could go wrong and, and even trying to uh, mitigate it or repair things before they've actually failed. All of those become possible once you put in some of the base infrastructure for the vehicle to communicate um, um, and update its software. Uh, and of course, you can keep all of those things themselves also updated by uh, uh, deploying new versions of the software and adding new capabilities. So. Um, we, we've seen this be done for things already in, in early versions like um, um, maintaining ba battery lifespan and, and uh, uh, protecting uh, the long-term health of the battery um, uh, is an example uh, where I've seen some of this stuff done already. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, when you, when, as soon as you open up connectivity and you, you implement next gen OTA solutions or over there update solutions. I mean, you, you open up um, a lot of additional features and functions and capabilities for the industry to take advantage of. Um, yeah. And a bunch of repair so, requests today yeah. are to go in for a software update. Um, and, yeah, uh, right. Uh, you know, it would be crazy if we all had to go back to the store just to get the new operating system put on our mobile phones. So uh, I guess uh, the era of doing that for the car is coming to a close. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, so we talked about the need to change across change across software development activities and the, and the, and how big this this change will this change will be so how how do we you know as an industry how do we make this change happen so i i think um there's a number of steps um uh to go through and and the the challenge is we've got to improve in several areas in parallel so on the deeply embedded end we talked a, a little bit about how you've got to speed up those development processes and to get more efficient there requires 
new approaches, new ways of working, uh, like I talk of, uh, talked about a little bit, like um, uh, virtual ECUs and doing testing in a virtual space instead of only on real hardware so that you can go faster uh, uh, there. The reason that's important is if you can go faster there, you free up resources and uh, software development resources to work on the other topics. And because you've got to work yeah. on these things in parallel and you don't have enough software engineers to do everything, you've got to take the effort and the cost out of somewhere. So most likely the place where the effort and cost can come out of, because it's where all the effort goes today, is those deeply embedded systems. What that also might mean is that the vehicle OEMs may also have to start to um, be a little bit more relaxed in how they specify those systems so that they're not uh, making them unique to themselves and they're just treating them like um, actuators um, that just happen to have complex software in them because to free up enough energy in the OEM side to work on the specification of um, uh, the central vehicle computers, the implementation of the ADAS systems, they also need to find the effort from somewhere. And probably where that effort comes from is to find ways to put less effort into the deeply embedded systems and just source them a bit more off the shelf, build them out of known building blocks, um, like just taking Autosar off the shelf and uh, uh, existing um, implementations um, without trying to make them too unique, um, which, is, which has been a habit of the automotive industry forever. Yeah. Yeah, I to totally agree. So I think um, with that, we can wrap up today's session. Um, thank you to everybody for, for participating, joining us today. Uh, special thanks from, from us at ETAS to the, the SA Detroit section and staff, um, as well as everybody else that helped Nigel and I, Nigel and I prepare for this, putting together today's uh, presentation like i mentioned in the in the beginning that we've recorded this and and uh it'll be available on youtube um at a later date on on the sa detroit section youtube channel um if you guys have any further questions or inquiries about the presentation please email the uh, sa detroit section and i think um the email address will be posted in the chat um and if you're watching this on YouTube, please consider liking the, vi the video and sharing it with someone who might find it useful as well as, 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 well as subscribing to the SAD Trade Section YouTube channel. And with that, um, I think we'll close today. And thanks, everybody, for, for joining us. Thanks, Nigel, for, uh, for, for, uh, for helping out here. Enjoyed it. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much. <laughs>